we now have our raw data inside Google Storage. Well, that is nice, but it just sits there and we can't really work with it. Also, you want to make sure that your data is available to a wider audience, especially one that might not be capable of passing a giant JSON file. So we are going to pass those JSON files and write the result into a data warehouse. From there, we can easily analyze the data and or make it available to other people that have access to our data warehouse. For this, there are actually multiple options available. We could, for instance, simply use a managed SQL database on Google Cloud. However, I want to take Google BigQuery for that. If you don't know Google BigQuery, think of a SQL database that is distributed and scales linearly with data size. However, BigQuery has a SQL interface, so it looks and feels like your regular SQL database. However, just because something supports SQL queries doesn't make it a SQL database. This is especially true for BigQuery because it's not your regular SQL database. Actually, I assume that in the backend, it's not a SQL database at all. This means that you need to drop some assumptions that you might take for granted. For example, there are no primary keys. Hence, when you load data into BigQuery, make sure that it is not in there already. A database in SQL is a dataset in BigQuery. A table in SQL is, well, a table in BigQuery. And there are multiple ways of loading data into BigQuery. For example, you can use the GUI, point it to a folder of files, define a schema, and load the files in automatically. However, that seems pretty boring and actually has nothing to do with Go. Hence, I will opt for another option where I pass the JSON files and stream single entries into BigQuery. All of this we do in Go. Also, when taking that route, we have the choice to use the legacy API or the newer API. However, for the newer, there is one more piece that I will cover in a later video. So for this video, we start with a simple legacy API that is also a bit easier to understand. Once we have covered the prerequisites for the newer API, you could use that one. So obviously our first task is passing those JSON files we already have. For this, I first wanna have a close look at one of those SEC files we loaded earlier. And I'm actually gonna use the gcloud command for that one. So we're gonna say gcloud, we're gonna use the storage, and we're gonna use copy, paste, and we're gonna use the Google storage protocol. And then comes the name of the bucket, which is go for data engineers storage. And the data is located under SEC Edgar facts stage. And the file was 00886982.2. And I'm just going to save it in my current home directory under result.json. File is getting copied. And let's have a look at the file. So I'm just going to open that one. So this is a pretty messy JSON string. And I would like to pre-print this in the terminal. And there are many ways for this to do. And I'm going to use the JQ utility on my Linux machine. If you don't have it already installed, that's what I assume. You can just install it. So you could say sudo apt. I'm on Debian, so I'm using apt install jq. Well, I have it already installed, so there's nothing really to install here. But you can go ahead and install it on your machine. So, so next, I create a pretty printed version of that JSON file. So I'm going to use jq. I'm going to use the root. And I'm going to use result.json. And I want to put this into a file called pretty.json. Okay, there is now a new file called pretty.json that has the content of the original JSON file just in a nicer format to look at. So let's take a look at the content. So I'm gonna say less, and I'm gonna use pretty.json. You can see that there is a key called CIK and one called entity name. This holds the CIK number and the name of the entity behind this CIK number. Next, there's a key called facts that holds another JSON structure. The keys on the first level stand for the accounting frameworks, like USGAP, for example. Inside those accounting framework JSONs, there are metrics like entity, common, stock, share, outstanding. Those hold another JSON structure with a label and a description of that metric. Also, there's a key called units, holding measurements of that metric inside another JSON structure. Okay, pretty complicated, but we can untangle this. Every unit holds a list of JSON structures that stand for a single fact in a certain point in time with some auxiliary information on that value. Okay, so let's write some code. However, I already know that I want to deploy that on Google Cloud Functions. So we need to make sure to create a new function for that. 
Actually, I want to put that into the already existing Edgar Facts function code. I will merely add another entry point that will be used for this new function. Let's go ahead and add the new function in Google Cloud. So we're going to move to Google Cloud, then into Google Cloud Functions. So again, like all, go to all products if you don't have it bookmarked, then serverless, and then Cloud Functions. Okay, then we say create function. We're going to use a first generation. I'm going to call this one parse Edgar facts. I'm going to locate that in Iowa. I'm going to use an HTTP trigger, which requires authentication. And I'm going to set some environment variables. I'm going to set bucket name. I know that I'm going to use that one. Go for data engineers storage. And I'm going to set the variable name stage to SCC Edgar facts stage. All right, so save the trigger. Next, I want to use go 1.21. I'm going to use a cloud source repository in the project go for data engineers and the repository name was, remember it was Edgar facts function. And the entry point for that one will be parse facts. And I'm going to stay with the branch and it will be on the master branch. Okay, so nothing here should be new. I set the name, co-located to my storage solution and set the environment variables needed to point it to the right location inside my storage account. Also, I use the already existing source code repository that we have created in the last video. So let's deploy that function. So I'm going to click deploy. Obviously this will fail, but that's fine. We just need to add the code into our repository. That is what we're going to do now. I'm going to head back into the editor. Let's close down this and let's go into my Edgar facts function. Let's go back into our project. So the first thing we are going to add to our code is the schema for our JSON file. Remember that the way to pass JSON in Go is to define a struct representing the schema of your JSON file. I think the internal data package is perfectly well suited for that. So we're going to go into the internal folder, then to data, data.go. So I suggest we start from the inside and work our way out. So obviously our smallest unit of measurement is a single data point for those units. This is pretty well defined, so we do the same. So I'm going to call this one fact content and it's going to be data point facts and it's a struct. So it has a variable called start, which is a string, and inside the JSON, that one's called start. Then we have end, which is also a string, where in the JSON it's called end. Then we have value, which I'm going to set to a float, and inside the JSON, well, I just see I made a mistake up here, so inside the JSON, that thing is called val. Now we have an account, which is a string. And it's, gonna, it's called ACNN. Then the fiscal year, which is an integer. Inside the JSON, it is called FY, fiscal period, which is a string. And JSON, it's called FP. Form, which is also a string. And in the JSON, that one is called form. And we have filed, which is also a string. And it's called filed. So let's save that. So all of this should be known from before. Just notice that I set the value to be a float. Sometimes it's an integer and sometimes it's a float. Since we can simply interpret integers as floats with a zero in the decimal, we can just use float. Next, remember that these data points belong to metrics that have a label, a description, and then another JSON with a list of data points for the units. And we can code that like this. I'm gonna call this one metric facts, 
which is a struct and the label is a string and in the JSON it is called label we have a description which is a string JSON it's called description and with units and this is gonna be a bit tricky so it's a map strings and a key and the value is a list or a slice of data point facts and in the JSON uh, is merely called units okay so the label and description should be obvious however look at the last item I define units to be a map holding strings well it is a JSON so the keys are strings as value, I declare that it is a slice holding data points. A data point is the struct that we have just defined before. We can simply use this as a type for our schema. Okay, almost there. So let's go to the highest level. We know that there is a CIK number and an entity. That is easy to encode. The hard part will be the facts, which is a map where the keys are accounting frameworks. Every accounting framework holds another map where the keys are metrics. The value of those maps is the metric fact struct we have just defined. So let us now put that into code. So one last thing. So type, let's call this one data facts, which is a struct. So we have a CIK number, which is an integer. And in the JSON, it's called CIK. We have an entity, which is a string. We have the JSON. It's called entity name. And we have some facts, which is a map with string keys, where the value is another map with string keys. This map has values, it has metric facts. And in the JSON, that one is called facts. So you can see that the facts are a map of string keys holding maps where the keys of those maps are strings and the values are metric facts structs. Not very easy to grasp, but just hold a pretty printed Edgar JSON file on the right and compare that to the structs. So you can just compare it side by side. So you can see in the highest level, we have the CIK number, we have the entity, and then we have the facts. So if you look on line 19 to 23, that's what we have used in the struct that encodes the highest level. Okay, then one level. So then we go into the facts, which is a map with strings as the key. Then inside we have another map where the keys are strings and the values are metric facts. And you can see right here, we have a label, we have a description, and then there's another map with string keys and data point facts as entries or actually it's a collection of data point facts and you can see here are the single data points so we have okay this one actually doesn't have a start value so let's pick one with a start value somewhere there you go so we have a start value we have an end value we have value we have account we have fiscal year we have fiscal period we have form and we have filed so everything is encoded here so let me close that down great so we now have the schema i actually want to make sure that this works as intended. And as a preliminary result, I will create a handler that takes a CIK number as input and will pass that JSON file using that schema we have just defined. I will flatten the data in there and return this in a list of flat JSON objects to whoever called that function. Obviously, this is not what we are aiming for in the end. However, if this works, I can change the code such that it streams the data into BigQuery. That we do in a second step though. So let's open the handler.go file. So first things first, let's create our trigger inside the init function. Remember that we called our entry point parse facts. So we go into the init function and we just add functions.http parse facts. And the function that I'm going to associate is parse facts handler. This should look familiar from the last video. Here we simply declare a trigger called parseFacts and we link it to the function parseFactsHandler. 
This function does not exist yet, so we need to create it. And remember that a function for Google Cloud Functions needs to take an HTTP response writer and the pointer to an HTTP request as input. We can pass the user input from the request body and rewrite our result to the response writer. And I define an entry point for parse facts. And I'll say func parse facts handler. And as input, it takes a response writer. I'm going to call this one whttp dot response writer comma r, which is a pointer to an HTTP request. Okay, so here we have the bare bone declaration of the function. Now it is time to put some logic into it. Again, the first thing we do is pass the user input and I assume that the user sends us the relevant CIK inside the request body as a JSON string. In order for this to work, we need to define the schema of the input request body. For this, we go back into the internal data package and define it in there. So let's just go back into the internal data package and let's define it in here. So I'm gonna say HTTP input for parse loader handler and it's gonna be type parse facts handler input which is a struct and I just assume this one field called CIK which will be a string and I just assume that in the JSON it will be CIK with lowercase. This time it's a bit easier because we basically just need to know what CIK or what file we want to parse. Hence I only take one input which is the CIK number since this will tell me what file I want to parse. Now we have created the relevant schema for the input request body. Let's go back into the handler file and read in the user input. But before we do this, I want to spare myself from sending an error to the caller using multiple lines of code. For this, I'm going to create a function. So let's create a new internal package called functions. So inside of the internal folder, I will create a new one called functions and it will be in functions.go. So let's go in there. And as always, I gotta declare my package. So this package is called functions. Gotta make some imports. So we're gonna import the formatting package and I need the net HTTP package, all right. So I wanna raise an error to a client, so to an HTTP client. And I'm gonna call this one raise error. And it takes a writer which is an HTTP response writer. It takes a message, which is a string error, which is an error, and a status code, which is an integer. So first thing, what I do is we write the status code in the header. So we say writer dot write header, and the status code is whatever we get. So if there is an error, so if the error is not nil, we're going to change the message to, well, we're going to do some string formatting. And we're just going to say this will be equal to a string colon, some natural representation, and will be the message and whatever the error is. And then the end, we just write the error message to the writer. So we're going to say fprint to the writer and we're going to use the message. Great. So it's basically the same code as before, but wrapped inside a function. We take a writer, a custom error message that should be returned, and also we take an error and a status code. First we set the status code to whatever the function input is. Then if the caller also supplies an error, we concatenate the error message with that internal error message of the error. In the end, the error is returned to the caller. Now it's time to go to the handler function. So let's go back into handler.go. So first thing is do is I'm gonna import that internal functions package. I'm gonna put an F in front of it and I will explain what this does. Then inside of the parsing of the facts, the first thing that we do is we parse the user input. So we're gonna create a variable called input user, which is 
a parse facts handler input. Then we're gonna decode the JSON. So we say error is equal to JSON dot new decoder, new decoder. This input, we're gonna use the body of the request. And then we're gonna decode that into input user. However, if we get an error, so if the error is not nil, then I wanna do something. And what I wanna do is, I wanna raise an error, whoops, uh, raise error. I'm gonna use the writer for that one that we got. I'm gonna send the error message, could not parse user input. Um, not gonna give it an error. And error message 400. And then we're gonna return. Okay, so first, check out the input statement that I have right here for the internal functions package. We already imported the Google Cloud functions package before, right here. Obviously, we have a naming conflict. For the internal package, I set an alias by just putting it in front of the import. Now I can access the Google functions package by writing functions and my own package by just typing F. I then parse the JSON body, so right here, so the JSON body of the import request. And if that doesn't work, I return error code 400 with a corresponding message. So let's also validate the CIK number like we did before. So let's also validate the user input. So if the length of the CIK number that the user has provided is not equal to 10, well, what we want to do is we want to raise an error again. And we're going to say CIK, oops, sorry, CIK must be of length 10. And we're not going to return an error. And we're got just going to set error 400. Never forget to return. So next, we need to do two things. First, check if a file for that CIK number exists. If it does not exist, we want to return an error to the caller. However, if that file exists, we want to load the content as raw bytes and return that to the function caller. The function returns a slice of bytes and an error. This is going to be a bit tricky since our function will basically do two things. This means we could potentially end up with different errors. Well, you would say just create some custom exceptions like you would do in most other programming languages. Good idea, but that does not work natively in Go since we just have the error struct. However, we could create a variable for a certain instance of an error. We can make that variable public and then just compare if the error we got back is equal to that one. If this functionality would be used by anyone but us, I would advise against the strategy since we cannot expect the end user to know something like this. If it would be a public library, I would split this function into two functions, but since it is only used internally, I'll just use a single one. So we're gonna go into the storage package. Okay, so now we create a function called getBytes, taking a bucket name and a path as its arguments, returning a slice of bytes and an error. Also, I will create an instance of a new error that I'll make public by naming it with an uppercase letter at the beginning of the variable name. So actually the first thing we gotta do is I gotta import something here. So I'm gonna import the errors package. I go back to the end, get some space. So I create a no file error, which I'm gonna say var error no file, which is an error, and it is errors.new file does not exist. All right, so we have now a custom made error. So it's an instance of an error with the error message, file does not exist. Great, so then let's create the function to load the bytes. So I'm gonna call this one get bytes. And it takes a bucket and a path as string arguments and returns a slice of bytes and potentially an error. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a client because I wanna interact with Google Cloud Storage. So let's create a context and we know that this will return a cancel function because I will set a timeout. So I'm gonna say context with timeout 
well, first the overall background context. And as timeout, I'm going to use like two minutes to uh, 120 seconds. So I'm going to defer the calling of the cancel function. And I'm going to create the client saying storage dot new new client and I take the context as input. If we get an error back, so if the error is not nil, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to return an empty slice of bytes and whatever the error is. And then I'm going to defer closing the client. Okay, so let's create the object representation of our data. So obj is equal to client dot bucket, whatever the bucket name is that we gave it, and then object to whatever the path is that we gave it. Then I'm going to, going to do so I'm going to load the attributes of that object. So I'm going to say, and I'm immediately going to throw this away. So I'm going to say underscore error equals obj dot attributes using the context. If that throws an error, so if the error is not nil, so the first thing I check is if the error we got back, whether that one is equal to storage, so the Google storage, error object not exist. So if we get back that error from Google, I'm going to return a slice of an empty slice of bytes and this custom made error no file that I just created. Else, if there's some other error, I'm just going to return an empty slice of bytes and whatever error we got back. So this is the first part. We start with creating a client and we've already learned how to do that in the previous video. Then we create a representation of our bucket from which we create a representation of the file that potentially lives in our data lake. If we encounter any errors, we return an empty slice of bytes and the error. Notice how I basically throw away the result of accessing the attributes of the object. I do that to trigger a potential error for non-existing objects. I don't really care about the attributes. I just want to check whether they exist or not. So next, we're going to create a reader for the content. So we say reader comma error equals object dot new reader. We're going to use that context that we've already created. Now, if that throws an error, actually, let me put some space in here. So if the error is not nil, we're going to return, well, an empty slice of bytes and whatever the error is. And then I'm going to defer closing that reader. Cool. And then I'm going to load this into a buffer. So the content I'm going to load into a buffer, which I call data, which could return an error. I'm going to use io dot read all. I'm going to use reader. So I'm going to read all the content in. I'm going to save that into a slice of bytes called data. And I'm going to say, if we get an error, well, what am I doing? Well, if guessed right, returning an empty slice of bytes and the error. Save this. And then in the end, never forget to actually return the buffer. So we return data and nothing for the error because at this point it worked. So first I start by creating a reader for the data inside that object. If that works, I use the read all function. So right here from the IO package and use the reader as an input. This will return a slice of bytes holding the content of that file and a potential error. Finally, if everything was successful, we return the content and nil for the error. Great, so let us now move back into the handler file where we have started implementing our function to run in Google Cloud. First though, we also need to read in the environment variables that we have defined before and configure the logger. So let's go back into the handler. So again, we are in the parse facts handler function. And actually I need to import something here, which is errors. So I'm going to load an environment. So we're going to load the environment variables. So I need a bucket name. I'm going to get this from the environment variable bucket. I need a folder path. 
which I get from stage. I need a project, which I get from the comment variable project. I need the dataset name for, so now we're talking about BigQuery here, which will be dataset. I need the name of the table where this should go into on BigQuery. And this will be in table. Now I'm gonna check the input of that. So if the bucket name is equal to an empty string, or if the folder path is equal to an empty string, or the project is equal to an empty string, or maybe we put some lambrics in here, data set is equal to an empty string, or table is equal to that. Well, if any of that is true, then what I want to do is I want to raise an error. And I'm going to call this one internal error. And I'm going to add to this one whatever the error is. Then I'm going to finish. All right, next on, let's configure the logger. So the logger is equal to log.new. I'm going to log to standard out. We don't need a prefix. I'm going to use the default flags. So next we're going to use the logic that will load the data from Google storage as pure bytes. If the data does not exist, I want to return a 4-4 error. If it is just some other kind of error, I would like to return a regular 500 error. So let's load the data in. So load data, actually let's lock this. So we're going to say logger.printf and we are going to say downloading staged data for, well, a string. Line break, and it's going to be whatever the user gave us as a CIK number. So the file name will be, well, we need to format a string here because remember we only get the CIK number, and it will be whatever the CIK number is, dot JSON. And we just take the input from the user, CIK. But then we also need the path to that file, and that one will be, well, we can use the file path dot giant function and we're going to use the folder path that we get from the environment variables with the file name all right data raw comma error because now we're going to load the data storage.get bytes so we're going to use the bucket name that we got from the environment variables we are going to use the file path that we have just created now if there is an error so if the error is not nil we're going to do the following so the first thing is we check if file exists. And we're gonna use the is function from errors. And if the error is equal to the error no file from earlier, well, if that is the case, then we're gonna raise an error. And we're gonna say file does not exist. Don't concatenate it and we return a 4 for error. And obviously, we got a return. Else, if it's some other error, we're gonna say, we're also gonna raise an error, but we're gonna say internal error. We're gonna give it. We're gonna print whatever the error is, and we're gonna set the status code to 500, and then we return. Okay, so you can see that we create the file name from the CIK number that we have parsed from the user input. Also, we're creating a file path by just joining the location of the stage folder with that file name. Afterwards, we use the getBytes function that we've created before using the name of the bucket and the file to the relevant path as input. This should return two things, a slice of bytes holding the data in JSON format and an error. There's now one special thing about that error. We can't just generalize and say that this will be an internal error. No, if the file does not exist, we need to return an error 404 since this is a user error. The user or service for that matter wanted to pass a file for a CIK number that simply does not exist. However, if we can't connect to the service, that should not return a for HTML error. It should return a value that represents a server error, a 500 for example. To achieve this, I use the is function from the errors package, so right here, and compare the error we got back from the instance I have created inside the storage package. If that returns true, it means that this error has happened because the file does not exist. 
In turn, I return a 404 error with the message file does not exist. Else I just do the usual. We still need to parse the JSON string to the structs we have defined in the facts internal package. For this, we first need to import the struct and then create a decoder for the bytes that we are reading into an instance of that struct. So let's parse the data. And we're going to say var data facts, which will be data dot data facts struct. And then we say, well, error equals JSON dot unmarshal. And you'll see unmarshal function here. And we're going to unmarshal the data raw bytes into the data facts variable. If there is an error, so if the error is not nil, I'm going to raise an error to the caller and say, could not parse data. Don't really, really need to return the error here. Actually, let's, let's do that. Let's return the error. And error code is 500. And if we forget to return. So here we basically just decode the raw bytes into the data facts struct. Remember that we wanted to return this as a list of flat JSON objects to the user. So we have defined how the input data looks like. However, we have not yet defined how the output data should look like. So let us now head back into the data package and define how we would like our output data to look like. Again, we're going to create a struct. However, this time the struct is not nested. So let's go into the data package. Actually, I got to import something here. So let's make some imports. And I'm going to import the time package. Okay, then I'm going to create a struct for the flattened facts. So I'm going to call this one out facts or out fact, sorry, because it's a single fact. And we have verbal call CIK, which is an integer. And I want in the JSON, I want this to go into a field called CIK. Then I have one called label, which is a string. And if it's being parsed to a JSON, I want this to go into a field called label. Then we have a unit, which is also a string. And if I pass that to a JSON, that should go into a field called unit. Then start, which is actually, it should be a time. And I'm going to put this into a field called start. Then we have end, which is also a time. And when it goes into a JSON, it's just going to be end. We have filed, which is another time, which goes into a field called filed. Then we have the fiscal year, which is going to be an integer, which goes into fiscal underscore year. We have fiscal period, which is a string. And that one goes into fiscal underscore period and account, which is also a string that goes into account. We have a form, which is another string to the field form framework, which is a string going to framework. value, which is a float 64. And it goes to the field a value. You can see that we create one large struct without any nesting. Once we decide to write data into BigQuery, we will stream instances of this struct into BigQuery. However, we can also package this data into a JSON structure since we added some JSON descriptors to it. So let us now loop over the entries of the data fact struct and then convert the entries in there to create instances of the out fact struct and put them in a slice. This fits quite well into a method on the data facts struct returning a slice of out facts. I'm going to create a method on this one here, on the top level struct, which is data facts. And I'm going to create this method and to make it a method, we just say func and then give it a pointer to data facts. And the method is going to be called flatten and it returns a slice of artifacts. So it's going to return slice of artifacts. So the one that we have defined down here, down here below. Let's init the slice. So I'm going to call this one artifacts slice. I'm going to make this one. 
it's going to be a slice of out fact. So this is what we're going to return in the end. I'm going to iterate over data. So for framework, cover facts. You're going to start ranging over the facts. Then we say for label metric, cover metric. We're going to range over those facts that we have gotten before. Then we're gonna label. Uh, we're gonna. Then we're gonna range over the label unit, comma unit. Inside of the metric dot units. Then we say for well, I don't need the index for every data point that we get. So we're gonna range over that one as well. Actually, I forgot the range keyword here. So we're gonna range over the unit. So first thing, let's pass the dates. Set a format time, so bear with me. This looks now weird, but I will explain this. So 2006, 01, 02. This encodes the formatting of dates in the data. Let me say start error. Time parse. So the first thing we're gonna parse is, I'm gonna use the format time and I'm gonna parse the data point dot start date. If that gives an error, so if the error is not nil, I simply set start to whatever the full time is. Put some spaces in here. I'm gonna do the same with the end. So time.parse format time. I'm gonna use the end. If the error is not nil, I simply set end to be the default value for time. And I'm gonna do the same for filed. So I'm gonna say time.parse format time data point data point dot filed. Now if the error is not nil, I set filed to the standard time. Okay, now we have parsed the time. Now we're going to create a single fact. sure to get some space here so we say fact single is equal to so this will be an out fact so the CIK will be equal to so remember that this is a method that applies to data fact struct so this is a method on the data fact struct and it has three values CIK entity and facts then we loop over the facts. Inside of the facts, we loop over the metrics. Inside the metrics, we loop over the unit. And inside the unit, we loop over the single data points. So the first thing that we do is we set the CIK number. So we're going to use the CIK field inside of that single instance that we're currently in. I'm gonna set that to CIK. And for label, we use the label metric, which if you look 25 lines above, so if you look right here, there it is, label metric. So you set that equal to this one. Then unit, I simply set to, well, label unit. So if you look 25 lines above again, it's label unit, it's right there, okay? Then we set start equal to the start variable, the one that I just parsed. And we're gonna set that one to equal to end. Filed, we're gonna set that one to filed. Fiscal year, well, that one will be will be inside the single data point. I'm gonna take the fiscal year field, fiscal period, I'm going to take that data point, take the fiscal period, fiscal period for count. We're going to the single data point that we're currently in in the in the loop. Take the account for the form, doing the same, taking the form, for the framework. We just take the framework because that one we have in this loop. So if we go a few lines above, there we have the framework, right? Because when we range over those facts, we get the framework in the as a string from the map. And then the value will be, well, we go into the dead point and just take that value. Then we need to append this to the slice. 
So you see out facts slice is equal to append to out sorry out facts slice this single fact that we have. And then after the for loop, which should end right here, let me just check. Yes, this ends right here. So this is where the for loop ends. Well, I want to return the result. So return out facts slice. Let me save this, go up, and start from the beginning. Okay, so, well, that was quite a bit of nesting, so let us now go over this step by step. So we start by creating an empty slice holding the out facts we have just created. Notice that I set the length to zero, but the size to 512. Since I don't want to have any default data when initializing the slice, the size is set to zero. However, I know that I'm going to add quite some data to it. To avoid too much reallocation of memory space, I set the initial size to 512, which will, prob which will probably be not enough. However, Go will figure out how to expand the size of that slice so we don't run out of space. Next on, I loop over that single facts field in the data struct that holds all the data for the past JSON document. Remember that the facts are organized first by accounting framework. Hence, I get the key and the values of that map. The key is the accounting framework that we assign to framework. Facts holds the actual data for that accounting framework. I then step into the facts map by looping over it. In there, the data is organized by metrics, hence the key will be a metric and the value will be another map. Hence, we go into th that map holding units. The key is the actual name of the unit and the value is a slice of structs holding the actual facts. So in the end, we range over the facts inside that slice. This is also where we will start to create an instance for a single fact that will go to the outside world. Notice how I cast the dates from string to an actual time. This probably looks a bit weird to you since all the other programming languages define the format of a date with some letters and maybe the percentage sign. In Go, you describe how the reference time of January 2nd, 2006, 3 o'clock, 4 minutes p.m. MST time zone looks like. Sounds weird, but actually makes a lot of sense if you ask me. You just need to remember the reference date. Since we now have all the data available that we need, we just use all those values we gathered inside the loops and set them to the respective fields inside the struct. Also, notice that I dropped the first element that gets returned when looping over the elements in the slice. So this should be somewhere over here. This is the position that I really don't care about. So once we have created our single facts, we just append it to the slice that will hold all the single pieces of information. For the final but only temporary step, we want to convert that slice of facts into a JSON string that we can write to the response writer. We will delete this once we are ready to write the data into Google BigQuery anyways, so no need to put that into some internal package. So let's save this and let's go back into the handler and do just that. And the first thing that we do is we're going to flatten the results and it will be saved into out facts slice and we take the data facts and we're going to use the flatten method that we have just defined. And then as a temporary step, we're going to write temporary results and we're going to delete this later. So I put this in all caps and I want to create a JSON string to out temp and it will be the result of json.marshalling that out facts slice. All right, if that throws an error, so if the error is not nil, I'm going to raise an error saying error writing temporary result. I'm going to concatenate the error with it and the response code should be a 500 and then I'm going to return. And then in the end, I'm going to write that to our response writer, but I'm going to convert that to a string. All right, save that. Great, so we are done here. Now it's time to take this for a test drive. For this to work, we first need to make sure to push this into our repository and then redeploy the function save and exit. I'm gonna say git add the changes, commit this, dash m, temporary result for parsing. I'm gonna push that to a remote repository. I went back to our cloud functions and redeployed it. So let's give it some time. So again, you can click on edit and then just redeploy. 
Okay, the function is redeployed. Now it's time for us to make a post request to that function. For this, we simply demand the Goldman Sachs data to be parsed. And I would expect to get a list of flat JSON data back. So the first thing that you can do is you can just copy the URL to the trigger. If you click on trigger and just copy that one, then we're gonna open the terminal again. All right, I'm going to call that function and I'm going to write the result into the, a file called result.json. So curl, I'm gonna make a post request to that URL. I'm gonna add a header here, which says authorization. It's a bearer token and we get the token by invoking this command, gcloud auth print dash identity dash token. So I'll close this. All right, gonna add another header, which will be content, content type, which is a JSON. Then we're gonna add some data to this one and it's gonna be a JSON string. So CIK will be 00008869826982. Make sure to close that one. And we are going to write this into result.json. Okay, give it a few seconds. Okay, there's that file. Then I'm going to pretty print that file and I'm gonna use the less utility. Okay, this looks great. Notice however that some of the start dates have a zero time. We just need to make sure that we cover those cases when streaming the data into BigQuery. Since we get the data in the way we want to, we can now remove the temporary code from this point onwards and focus on streaming data into BigQuery. So we are going to remove the temporary code now. So let me go back into my editor, then into the handler. So we know that this works. So what we can do is let's get rid of the temporary code and actually just save this. To get the data into BigQuery, we first need to create a table that we can load data into. Hence, navigate back into the Google Cloud interface. So go to All Products, and then navigate to Analytics, and then choose BigQuery. The first thing that you want to do is create a dataset. As mentioned, a dataset is like a database in the traditional SQL world. Hence, click on the three dots next to your project name and select Create Dataset. And we are going to call this dataset Edgar since we might want to add other data from the Edgar database. So this one is gonna be called Edgar. For the location type, we simply go with region. However, in a production setting, you might want to replicate your data into different regions. And I'm going to choose Iowa for that one. I'm fine with all the rest. So let's click on create dataset. Cool, so we now have a dataset where we can create tables in. And that is exactly what we are going to do. We're going to create a table for our company facts that is going to have the same schema like our flat facts. To create a table, you need to click on the three dots next to the dataset name and click on create table. Most of the stuff is already filled out. However, for the table name, we are going to select facts. So we want an empty table. The dataset is Edgar and the table name is going to be called facts. We want a native table. Okay, now comes the most important part for every table. We need to define the schema. Make sure that you have the struct definition for our flat facts at hand since we're going to replicate that schema. And I'm going to do this. So I'm going to put this side by side. I'm going to open the, there we go. Okay, so let's create a schema. So I'm gonna add a field here, which I'm gonna call CIK, which will be an integer. And I'm gonna make this required. Then label, which is a string, which I'm also gonna make it required. And we have unit, which is also a string. And I'm gonna make this one required as well. Then we have start, oops, sorry. Then we have start. I'm going to set this to a timestamp, which is nullable. Then we have end, which I'm also going to set to a timestamp, which is nullable. We have filed, which I'm going to set to a timestamp, which is also nullable. Now we have the fiscal, fiscal underscore year, which is an integer, which is also nullable. I'm going to choose the fiscal underscore period, which will be a string. 
and it's also nullable. Then we take account as a string, also nullable. The form, which is also a string and nullable. Then we're going to choose framework, the accounting framework, which is a string, and I'm going to make this required. And then last but not least, we're going to have a value, which is a float, and it is required. So let me check really quick. CAK, integer required, label, string required, unit, string required, start, timestamp nullable, end, timestamp nullable, field, timestamp nullable, fiscal year, integer nullable, fiscal period, string nullable, account, string nullable, form, string nullable, framework, framework, string required, and field, float required. You can see that all the fields that we have in the flat fact struct are in this schema as well. You can also see how the schema matches. However, what might need a bit of explanation is why some of the fields are nullable and some are required. Well, I know that there will always be a CIK number, else this entire exercise wouldn't really make much sense. Also, I know that the unit and the accounting framework are map strings. Hence, they are also always there. It makes sense to set them to be non-nullable. I also set the value to be required, since it wouldn't make much sense to save a fact without a value attached to it. For all the other data, I just want to make this a bit more flexible and give myself the option to not set a value if things go wrong. I'm also going to cluster the data in the table by CIK number, since I assume our users only want to receive data for a specific set of CIK numbers. This should increase the performance of our queries. So I'm going to set the clustering ordering to the CIK number. Finally, we create our table. So let's click on Create Table. Great, we now have our table, but there obviously isn't any data in it yet. Let's change that by streaming some data into it. The way we implement this is pretty straightforward. There needs to be a struct that represents a row in our table. We already have that. It is our struct representing the flattened facts. However, that struct must implement the value saver interface as defined by the BigQuery designers. A struct implements the value saver interface when it has a save method that returns a map with strings as keys and BigQuery values as values. Also, it needs to return a unique insert ID and a potential error. If there already is a row with such an insert ID, BigQuery will not insert the row. So let us now create such a safe method on our outfact struct. First though, we need to install the BigQuery package. So actually, let me put this to full screen mode. Let's go out and let's say go get cloud.google.com forward slash go forward slash big query all right let's go back into the editor so let's open up internal data data.go and i'm going to import cloud.google.com forward slash go forward slash big query and now we're going to implement this safe method and it's part of the out facts so let's just put it down here so we're going to say func it's attached to the out fact and it's a safe method it doesn't take any inputs but as output we get a map with string keys and bigquery values as values then also a string which is the unique deduplication id and an error so let me actually get some space so let's create a row so the row is equal to, well, a map with string keys and BigQuery values. So BigQuery.value, and we're going to create one. So the CIK is, well, whatever is in the CIK for that single fact, for the label. And here I'm just going to use those column names that we defined in the schema. So I'm going to take that single fact and take the label for unit do the same with the unit start do that with the start for end take the end value for file take the file value for fiscal underscore year for so for that big query column we are going to take fiscal year for fiscal underscore period we're going to take fiscal period from that single data fact 
for the form. We'll just take the value from the form field. Count. Well, you've guessed it. Count framework. Take the framework. And for value, you take the value. Great. Now let's not forget about the deduplication ID. So the ID is equal to big query dot no deduplication ID because I simply don't want one. And then we need to return the result. So we are going to return that row, which is the map of strings with big query values our ID and nothing for the error. Save that. Oh, that looks like there's an error, line 135. Oh, yeah, forgot the comma there. You can see that we are defining a method called save for the outfact struct. This should return a map where the keys are strings and the values are BigQuery values. Also, it returns a string and an error. First on, we create the requested map. You can see that the keys are the names of the columns in our BigQuery table and the values are the fields inside of our outfact struct. Next on, I would create an ID for deduplication. However, I'm not going to do that here. So I simply use the no dedup ID struct that is defined in the BigQuery package. In the end, I return those two things plus nil for the error. Our outfact struct now implements the value saver interface. Hence, we can use it to stream data into BigQuery. For this, we can create another function inside the storage sub package and create a function that takes a slice of outfacts and uploads the data into BigQuery. There's just one thing we need to do before. The flatten method should return a slice of pointers to the flat facts, not the facts itself. We need to do this since the inserter for BigQuery expects references. So let's make that small adjustment in our flattened method. So I'm simply going to change this so it's not returning a slice of outfacts but it is returning a slice of pointers to artifacts. Then one more thing, when we create that slice, well, it's a slice of pointers. And then in the end, when we append to that slice, we're not appending the fact, we're just appending a pointer. Great, this way our flat method will return a slice of pointers, just what the BigQuery inserter expects. Next on, let us create a function that streams the facts into our BigQuery table. I would like to do that in small mini batches. Additionally, I would like to lock failed batches using our already created locker. So let's open the storage sub package. So storage, storage.go. And I gotta do some imports here. So first on, let's, oops. so first on, let's import cloud.google.com, go big query, and let's use our internal. So getup.com, getup handle, Edgar facts function internal data. So I want the internal data package. Then go to the end and I'm going to create a function that streams rows into big query. So func stream rows and it takes a project name, a day set name table name, uh, which are strings, some rows, which is a slice of data dot artifact pointers, and a batch size, which should be an integer. Also, let's put in a logger. So those are loggers. And it will potentially return an error. So first thing we do in that function, as always, we create a client. And for the client, I need a context. So ctx, comma, cancel, because I want to have a timeout with that one. Context dot with timeout. And as the base case, we take the background context. And I'm going to use 280 seconds for the timeout. Then I'm going to defer the call of the cancel function. Then I'm going to create that client. So client comma error is equal to bigquery dot new client. Use that contacts and we need to give it the project name. 
Now, if that throws an error, so if the error is not nil, well, we simply return that error. Else, I'm gonna defer the closing of the client. Then we need to create an inserter. So the inserter is equal to client dot dataset. So whatever the dataset name is, period table, whatever the table name is. And then for that table, I need an inserter. And finally, we upload data in batches. So this is going to, we're gonna range over that row slice. So we say for start and bear with me, zero. Semicolon. As long as start is less than the length of rows, then I'm going to increase start by that batch size. So inside that loop, first thing I do is set the end value for the subslice that I'm going to use, or for that mini batch basically. So the end is equal to start plus whatever the batch size is. Okay, then gotta check for an early stopping. So we should stop if end is greater than the length of rows. And shorten the end number for cases of early stopping. So if stop is true, then what I wanna do is, then I wanna send end equal to the length of the rows. Okay, now let's get the batch of rows. So rows batch, that is our mini batch, is rows, well, whatever the start position is and whatever the end position is. Then I'm going to upload this and I need some space here. Then I'm going to upload this. So error equals searcher dot put, use the context that we already have and that mini batch, so rows batch. If that throws an error, so if the error is not null, I'm actually going to lock that. So print F, and I'm gonna say error uploading to data warehouse. Let's make this a bit more general. Let's set whatever the natural representation is and a line break, and I'm just gonna use that error for that mini batch. And then in the end, so now we are exiting the for loop. We want to return a result of that function call and we're just gonna return it actually. Okay, so let's save this, check that this works. Oh, there's an error, line 117. What's the error? Yes, of course, this should not be a comma. This should be a semicolon. Let's save this, great. Okay, so the implementation seems a bit complex, but it's actually straightforward. So as usual, let's go over this step by step. First, we obviously need to import the BigQuery package and the internal data package. So I did that at the very beginning. So you can see right here, I'm importing the BigQuery package and the internal data package. So the function takes in the project, dataset, and table name that uniquely identifies where we wanna write the data to. Also, it takes a slice containing pointers to artifacts we have created inside our internal data package. We define the amount of batching given by a batch size variable. Lastly, we also drop the pointer for a logger that will be used to log potential errors. Inside the function, the first thing that we create is a context with a timeout of a little less than five minutes. I will set the timeout for the entire function to five minutes. Hence, I take a few seconds off for overhead. The first time we interact with BigQuery is when we create the client. As input, we just give it the context and the project name. Since I want to clean up the resources, I close the client in a deferred call. From that client, we create a representation of our data set, from which we create a representation of our table. For that table, we create an inserter that will take a mini batch, invoke the save method on the items in there, and then write results into BigQuery. To actually put the data into the inserter, I start a loop. Since I want to put smaller slices of the entire slice into the inserter, I will need an inclusive starting point and an exclusive endpoint for the elements that I want to read from the slice. So I start by setting the start value to zero and I wanna keep going with my loop as long as the start value for the sub slice is less than the length. 
At the end of every iteration, I increment the start value by whatever batch size I decide on. So going into the loop, we start by defining the end position for our current batch. This will be whatever the current starting position is, plus the batch size. Remember that the end position is non-inclusive. The thing is, if the end position is greater than the actual size of our row slice, Go will panic because it simply can't read from that slice. Hence, we need to check whether we need to shorten the end a little bit. So I simply check whether end is greater than the size of the or the length of the slice, which returns a Boolean value, and I put that into the stop variable. If we should stop early, I set the end to whatever the length of my slice is. Next on, I read in a subslice by reading from the starting position to the end position and assign that to the rows batch variable, which will be a slice of pointers to outfacts. Then in the end, we use the put method of the inserter, give it our context with a timeout and the slice with our mini batch. If this operation returns an error, we lock that with our already created logger. For a production application, it would probably make sense to include some more information when logging the error, since you might want to retry those specific facts, not the entire thing. However, for our simple example, that suffices to get the basic point across. If everything finishes, we simply return none for an error. It doesn't really make sense to do this since we never return an error at any other uh, place, but I think this is a good idea for a future implementation. Maybe as an exercise, try to come up with a logic that collects all the errors and returns them in an error at the end if there's at least one error instead of just logging that to the logger. Great, so we have everything ready now to be included inside the handler code where we used to return a list of facts to the caller. Go back into the handler code and stream the rows into BigQuery. So let's save this one more time. Then we go into the handler code. So we're now going to stream that to BigQuery, but now is actually a very good point in time to read those environment variables back in. So the project is going to be inside the project environment variable, the data set that will be in the data set environment variable and the table, well, that will also be an environment variable, which is called a table. And then obviously we gotta check if those are set correctly. So let's check whether the project is an empty string. Then we check for whether the data set is an empty string. And then we check whether the table is an empty string. All right, okay, let's save this. Let's go all the way back down to the bottom. So let's get some space. We are going to stream into BigQuery. First things first, let's actually lock this. So we are streaming that many rows into BigQuery. I break. And we're just going to take the length of outfacts slice. So this is printed. Then we actually start the streaming. So storage.stream rows. Well, project we already have. We got this from the environment variables. Same for the data set, same for the table. Then we just need to supply the outfacts slice. Let's do a mini batch of 30 and the logger is already defined. Now, if the error is not nil, so then we basically just raise an error again. We say could not upload data. Let's concatenate that with the original error message. And the error code will be 500, then we return. And finally, we return the result to the call of the function. And we're just gonna say, let's just say success. Let's save this. So I simply lock how many rows I am planning to load into BigQuery. Afterwards, I use the stream rows function from our internal storage package and give it the necessary inputs. Note that I decide on a batch size of 30 rows. I think that this is a fair value that guarantees performance while it also shouldn't overpower the inserter. Note that in the end, I merely return the string success to whoever was calling the function. For deployment, let's make sure that the code sits in our Git repository by committing the changes and then pushing the code into our remote repository on Google Cloud. So let's get, let's leave the editor. Let's say git add dash a, and I'm gonna commit those changes. I'm gonna say stream data into BigQuery, and then I'm gonna push those changes to the remote repository. 
Oh. Okay, so let's go back into Google Functions. So we got to redeploy this one. So click on Edit. And actually, I'm going to change this a little bit. I'm going to set the timeout for this function to 300 seconds. And then we click on Next. And let's deploy that. So the deployment should take some time. Oops, there seems to be an error. What's the error? Can it use W? Uh, is the string I'm going to? Yeah, uh, of course it's F print, uh, not print F. So let's change that. So we go back into the handler, and it's not going to be print F. It's F print. There you go. So let's put that back into our remote repository. Let's call this bug fix or final return. And let's put this back into the original repo. Then we're going to redeploy this. Uh, actually, let me just check. Did it take the 300? Oh, yep. Uh, don't forget to put this to 300 seconds. And we're going to say this next. Yep, yep, yep. Everything's fine. Deploy. And we wait. Okay, now that we are done and we can test that our function works as intended. For that, I will try to load the company facts for Goldman Sachs into our BigQuery table. By the way, if you don't want to use curl directly, you can also let Google make that request for you. You can just enter the testing tab and define the body request and then do the request. The nice thing about this approach is that it will also show you the server logs. So let's do that. So let's give it a CIK. So this is the request body and the request body will be a JSON string CIK and the CIK name is 008088. 6982. There's internal error because I actually forgot one more thing. <laughs> so let's edit. Can you guess what I forgot? Well, I forgot to add those environment variables. So project. Uh, let's make sure to spell that correctly. So project dataset and table. So that project is go for data engineers the data set is edgar and the table is facts so let's deploy this one more time okay let's give this one more try so crk number should be 0008869 Eight, two. So I should know this by heart now, actually. So let's run this, hope for a successful result. Okay, looks like we got a success back. Fantastic. If we navigate into BigQuery, open our data set and table, we should be able to query our data. So let's open BigQuery. So if you haven't bookmarked it, it's on all products, analytics, and then BigQuery. So let's check out that table and let's query that one so you can just click on actually let's click on preview there you go you have already some data in here if you look on details you can see that we have all the rows in there but we can actually just query the data so we say in new tab we want to create a query so we say select star from backticks go for data engineers dot edgar dot facts so we have the project the data set and the table and we say limit 1000 we don't want to get all the data so let's run this and there you have it our table with the data we put in we could now go ahead and pass other company fact JSON files as well so this has been a pretty lengthy video but we covered quite a bit you learned how to load data from google cloud storage how to pass even very complex json files how to return an http response and how to put data into bigquery using the legacy streaming api I hope that you found this video useful and you can certainly give yourself a pat on the back for making it through this to this point. There's also another API that you can use, but that one is using protobuffers. Hence, we are going to cover those next, but I think I will choose another use case for that one since we use the Edgar database quite a bit now. So once you understand protobuffers, you actually have all the tools necessary to use the newer API for streaming data into BigQuery.